This event marks a, a major milestone in a process that began over three years ago that we call Corporation 2020. And during that period, a really extraordinary group of people, about 200, to come together in workshops, electronics, dialogue, uh, writing, research, and so forth to explore issues of corporate purpose, corporate form, and generally the future of the corporation. Whether it's supply chains, whether it's capital labor relationships, uh, whether it's corporate governance and the role of investors, whether it's long-termism -term -term and short-termism, these debates have been going on for a very long time. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, one of our presidents, of course, many of you know, uh, from U.S. or otherwise, and also one of the, basically the author, principal author of the Declaration of Independence, said that in 1814, merchants have no country. The mere spot they stand on does not constitute so strong an attachment as that from which they draw their gains. He later said, getting more excited about the question of corporations, I hope we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. And in 1872, a gentleman stood where I'm standing now, or perhaps up there, a fellow named Charles Francis Adams, Adams being a great old Boston man, anticipating future debates over the equitable sharing of wealth created by corporations. He said, the lines of division in our community must not become horizontal, but to prevent their becoming so, it is necessary that labor and capital should be partners, that they may not be enemies, or that failing, it is necessary that the laborers should own their own capital and not the capitalist labor. And a few years later, uh, another gentleman, again in these halls, Charles William Elliott, uh, speaking on July 4th, which was a tradition in Faneuil Hall, if a new Declaration of Independence were written today, now in the early 20th century, it would deal chiefly with social and industrial rights. A new Declaration of Independence would give vigorous expression to the popular conviction that the natural resources of the country, including the public health, are not to be sacrificed to secure immediate profits to a few individuals or corporations. Uh, today, it's a paradox in some sense. These fundamental questions of corporate purpose corporate design, corporate futures, they really are the, rarely, sorry, rarely are the subject of public scrutiny. They don't have a place on the agenda, like healthcare, global security, education. We're trying to give it a name here, give it authenticity, give it legitimacy, bring it forward as something that should be the part of our public discourse, part of our duty as citizens to discuss. Thank you very much. Of course, it doesn't feel like that to the well-meaning people inside, the people of a talent who are working more hours than they should, playing the game as they understand, by the rules as they understand it, hmm? which is, as they see it, making all the money that they possibly can while keeping the law, and indeed it's also more than the law, obeying the conventions of society, hmm? and giving that money as much as they sensibly can back to the people who invested them and trusted them with their money, or now the people who bought their shares from them at 16 times the rubes, but nevertheless giving them all back as much as they can, and working more hours, as I say, that they feel they should. Great ideas with unintended consequences. The first great idea was the joint stock company, which allowed well, it started in the early years of the 1500s, soon after Christopher Columbus discovered this great country, which had been minding its own business for 2,000 years. But suddenly, there it was, and they, the British decided that they could exploit it, plus the lands to the east. 
But in order to do that, they needed to collect capital more than one person could have, so friends and associates were invited to join, and we had the first joint stock companies in the early 1500s, the Muscovy Company to trade with Russia, the East India Company, the Hudson Bay Company. But these companies were given a charter for a limited period for a specific purpose. The East India Company had to come back every 20 years to get its charter renewed by Parliament. So there was some control by government over the activities of these concerns. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to the early years of the 19th century and 1800, and this other bright idea of limited liability was conceived by the UNOC state, and eventually in 1854, it became a legal possibility in Britain and then in America. And the combination, of course, of joint stock companies and legal liability unleashed a fantastic flow of innovation, enterprise, money, wealth creating boom. And then came, of course, most recently, the third great innovative idea, the executive stock option, the great <laughs> contribution that your country has given to the world. Hmm? Um, because this seemed to say that now that executives would be identical in their interests with the shareholders and the investment, therefore what is good for me must be good for the corporation, must be good for the investors, must be good for society. This was a fuse. This is working towards the bomb that I can see might actually blow up capitalism because they desperately need to be changed. Those great ideas have had unintended consequences. Adam Smith would be appalled. In other words, the leadership for social change comes from outside government from opinion firmers, from leading examples, mm -hmm, from the people in this room. So guess that is why we are here. Um, we need all these pressures. We also, I think, need an articulate leader, no doubt, another William, William Wilberforce, as has been mentioned, to bring these things together so that the people outside wandering through those anonymous glass towers can hear, because otherwise they may not notice what we're saying. I think to remind you that there should be a moral purpose in life for individuals and for companies, for without that moral purpose, we are condemned to be chained to a meaningless treadmill for the rest of our days. And that is something that we don't deserve. So good luck to us all, and thank you very much. there's a danger that corporate citizenship has co-opted much of the sustainable development uh, agenda. And that what was happening is that companies are actually institutionalizing their thought processes, their responses, uh, rather more peripherally uh, than they ought to be doing. And you get almost these snowballs, uh, these, these sort of uh, snowball-like agendas, which entrain just one damn issue after another. And the problem is, buried in those snowballs are some really key strategic issues uh, for companies. And the problem is that very often those aren't getting through to the board in the way that they uh, need to do. The question that we've been asked to address in this um, session is, um, are corporations equipped for the 21st century to set the stage for the later discussions? Henry Minsberg uh, will start. Um, Many of you will know him for his book, The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning, but he's, he's written much else. He's uh, a, a considerable critic uh, of the way in which business schools, like uh, Harvard Business School or Wharton or others, have gone about what they do. Uh, no great enthusiast, I think, for 
uh, MBA style uh, education. Our second speaker first really uh, impacted me uh, when his book, um, When Corporations Rule the World, came out, I think, in 1995. So a very early uh, voice of the anti-globalization movement, or at least anti-globalization in the format which corporations have uh, chosen to, to some degree, impose uh, upon us. And um, you'll all know David's distinction between the sort of the cowboy and the spaceship uh, economy. And then third, we'll take Ari de Goes, who, who uh, sorry, Hus, um, who uh, you will know um, partly because of his, like Charles, he was for many years at uh, Shell. He led the uh, scenarios uh, group there uh, for many years when they were le leading the field uh, in that area. And like uh, other two panelists, has also done a quite extraordinary book, uh, The Living uh, Company. Let me start by saying I'm all in favor of the socially responsible corporation, and I mean that quite seriously. Without, without responsible people in high places, uh, our society is worth nothing. Um, but I want to go well beyond that. I'm also in favor of the alignment of deck chairs on cruise ships. Um, and the question we're facing, I think, is whether we're sailing on the Titanic. Um, and I think we're sailing on the Titanic. Um, in other words, I think that, um, that the answer to the, to the grave problems that I think face society today go well beyond what corporations will be able to do. Let me talk about cause. The, the, the obvious cause that people would point to uh, is the corruption that we see every day in the newspapers. Um, I don't think that's the problem today. Uh, I think that's the tip of the iceberg, and it's the tip of the iceberg that's above the surface in the sense that once that corruption comes out, we can deal with it in courts of law. Far more serious is what I call the legal corruption, uh, which involves all kinds of practices and behaviors that are unacceptable, even though they're legal. Uh, uh, the, the most uh, corporate compensation that uh, Charles has already mentioned is one obvious thing. Um, but the, uh, but the, I think downsizing the casual way in which people are fired in companies or, or dispensed with in companies. It's not coincidental that the use of the term human resource came about at the same time as a lot of this downsizing. If people are human resources, they can be dispensed with. If people are human beings, uh, they can't be dispensed with. I'm not a human resource, I'm a human being. But I don't think the heart of the problem is in the legal corruption any more than I think it's in the illegal corruption. I think the heart of the problem is in the imbalance in society, the imbalance um, between the corporate or, or business sector and other, and other sectors. It's the trumping of the social and the political consistently by the economic that I think is the heart of the problem. We have an economic stranglehold that is a, an economic dogma, at least, that has a stranglehold on society. And I think that's a huge, huge part of the problem. And the power of the corporations is the most obvious manifestation of that. We have a kind of coalition of, if you like, of economic dogma with financial greed. And it's uh, causing huge problems. So I think we need to change the question. It's not our corporations equipped for the 20th century, 21st century, but is the 21st century equipped for mankind? Let me repeat, I'm in favor of socially responsible corporations. I admire them. I think it's critically important in their place. And what we're having today is the corporate sector out of its place. If you want to be responsible, get out of my government. Get out of my social life. And, and stay where you do the best good possible, which is on the economic side and on consumption. Um, and that's what we, uh, what we desperately need, it seems to me, is to, uh, is to balance that. Corporations as persons is an aberration. If corporations really want to be persons in the eyes of the law, then let them be persons in the whole respect. If a corporation breaks the law, let it go to jail for several years. In other words, let it stop functioning in society for several years. No corporation will accept that, so no corporation should accept being a person in the eyes of the law, having it one way and not the other way. The institutional system of global financial markets and the corporations that serve these markets 
are designed and dedicated to growing consumption to increase the financial assets of the already wealthy. To put it bluntly, they're designed to convert real capital into financial capital, which is fictitious, is simply an accounting chip. Increase financial capital to increase the relative power of the already wealthy. Now let me suggest this critical point, that the only legitimate reason for a government to issue a corporate charter extending special privileges to a group of private investors is to serve a public purpose. There is simply no ethical or democratic rationale for the existence of a pure private benefit corporation. So what will be critical elements of the new system's design? There's amazing organizational design talent in this room, and that's one of the things that so excites me about this gathering. We must set for ourselves a design task that goes way beyond redesigning the corporation. We need a design for a new global economy grounded in different values and institutional forms that unleash the full creative potential of the human species and direct it to addressing the needs outlined above. So where do we look for leadership for change? This is a very difficult question that's already been raised. It seems to me very unlikely that a system designed to increase consumption and inequality is going to transform itself from within to a system devoted to reducing consumption and reallocating resources equitably to responsible beneficial uses. Among other things, this would require wealthy people voluntarily and universally to accept negative financial returns on their investment. I suggest that the initiative to reclaim government, to change the rules and bring forth a new economy that places life values ahead of financial values increasingly depends on voluntary citizen action from outside the corporate system. That sometime in the early 1980s, capital ceased to be scarce. Capital, the capital market moved from a seller's market to a buyer's market. Since the, the last 20 years, capital is a commodity, just like iron ore. And that is the world in which our corporations have to live. And their statute is one in which the law gives the capital supplier the absolute powers of hiring, firing, and self-remuneration. Because that was the obvious thing to do in the 19th century. But that is still the case in the corporate law, in the company law here in the US, as far as I know. It is still the case in the company law in the United Kingdom where I live, and it is definitely still the, co the case in the company laws in continental Europe. But the consequences of capital and therefore of savings and therefore capital to be just a commodity means that capital is no longer the success factor in business. What I told you earlier about the 70 percent of market value of our major corporations that nowadays are intangible assets, what that fact is telling you is that the critical factor in business nowadays, the factor for, to create success is human talent. It is people. And that means, that means that the challenge that to run companies nowadays, to run corporations, the challenge to run a successful corporation is that you as management, you have to be good at the maximization of the talent that you have. And this is true whether you are in the rising new business. This is quite obvious if you're in the banking business. This is quite obvious if you're running Microsoft. But it is equally true if you're running Shell. Success nowadays for Shell to be better than Exxon is to have more access to more human talent, 
to develop that human talent better than your competitors do and to retain that talent rather than letting it run away as is unfortunately the case in many businesses. The shareholder nowadays is an institution. It is no longer a person with the same objectives as you have as management. No, it's an institution with its own objectives, which are almost certainly different from the objectives of the corporation in which they hold the shares. Their objectives are short-term. And these short-term objectives are put by the financial com community in terms of targets for growth and profits. Somebody sits in Wall Street and in the city of London and tells your company that they expect you to grow 3.8% this year and make 17% profit. And if you don't, if you miss the target, the sell notice goes up. Your share price comes down. And unless you are very big, and very big nowadays means that you have a market value of at least in excess of $100 billion, anything below that means you're just a nice, juicy little target. I would conclude that change in legislation is needed. The company law has to change, and, and, and we have to do it pretty quickly because already there a lot of damage is being done to the economic uh, production capacity of our countries, and I think that is the real drama. I think that, that being in the business world, I have both tremendous optimism for the moment we are in as well as tremendous concern. There has been an almost obsessive focus and conversation about sustainability and corporate responsibility recently. And while it's wonderful to have that attention, it is equally challenging to ensure that we seize that opportunity to generate the kind of deep and significant change that is needed to address the challenges that our society faces. It's really interesting to hear, and, and it, it seems almost silly, but when I hear the words that business should have a moral purpose, I think, well, of course, and yet I'm not quite sure that that discussion is happening inside quite enough boardrooms at companies. And I was specifically asked to focus on what works in managing large-scale change in companies and, you know, what are some common mistakes that uh, creates failures in, in those change agendas and what are some of the challenges. So that's where my specific comments are going to be focused. I'm really incredibly personally passionate about this topic. And the reason I'm passionate is uh, when change isn't done well, uh, many stakeholders uh, lose. Many stakeholders suffer. Uh, those may be employees. They may be communities. And so learning how to really manage large-scale change uh, is, a, is a pretty important topic and it's one that I care a lot about. You know, I can't help but reflect on the early 90s uh, in one of the companies I was involved with, IBM. Uh, there were IBM sites across small towns, small to medium-sized towns, uh, largely across the East Coast, but around the world. And those towns went through incredible pain and suffering as IBM had not adapted well to a changing world. And as IBM was struggling to figure out how to change fast enough to keep up with, with the world. Uh, 
those kind of experiences have had a big impact on me and has driven a lot of that passion. The second reason I'm really passionate about uh, getting change right is, in my opinion, uh, the world is becoming much more densely interconnected, much more interdependent, which by definition means that the pace of change is increasing. Uh, because as any one component in that dense interconnectedness changes, it creates ripple effects throughout the causal networks. And as the pace of change increases, a lot of those pathways create nonlinear or highly volatile events. And so there can be a lot of disruption. And, uh, and in my opinion, those that learn how to manage change well will survive and thrive, and those that don't will die. So my point of view is, as a practitioner of change, is that the world is at a crossroads. And I've tagged it perhaps an interconnectedness tipping point. Uh, we're gaining insights into complex systems, but uh, it's in, it, the complexity is growing increasingly difficult uh, to manage. Theory methods and tools for seeing uh, relevant systems are, are lacking. The schools are not uh, building uh, uh, curriculums that build this kind of competency uh, and the business world needs them desperately. And just to set up my comment, back in 1995 is when we really started thinking about and acting about what is our role as a corporation in the world and what is our impact in all the 160 company, or countries uh, in which we do business. And for about the next 10 years, and it was mentioned earlier, we were really laying the foundation for what we do in the future. And it did take a long time to understand what does this word sustainability mean. And several people in this room, Joe Lauer, Peter Senge, John Elkington, they helped us think about that. So during that time, we were taking action, but we were still trying to think strategically what does this mean. In the year 2006-2007, we fundamentally underwent and are undergoing what we're calling a radical shift in how we look at business and how we change the game. And that is certainly at a strategic level, at a structural level, how we run our business as a process, but also at the people level and culturally. What kind of shifts does this require? And culture is probably the biggest piece. But from the perspective of corporate responsibility, we are also realigning those resources against our business. We're moving from a product-based organization to a consumer-based organization. Um, if you take that to an external level, I would take it one step up from the corporation into the industry. And if you think about an industry of like-minded corporations, we're all vying for the best talent, the best minds in the business, we're buying for the same market share, but what if we came together in the spirit of uh, cooperative competition to start solving for the greatest stressor within our industry? It's not something that defines you as a brand, but we're all going to have to deal with water. We're all going to have to deal with energy. And if we collectively come together, we will get to a solution much, much quicker than if we're trying to do that on our own. So uh, that would be, again, from an external view, what can we do differently in the future? But I want to re remind people that many of the most significant steps in evolution were not from slow, continuous improvement. They were actually from spasms of nature, cataclysmic events that caused quantum leaps. And I like to think that we are at that moment now of where there's a convergence of global warming, of, of end of peak oil, of huge, unthinkable inequities uh, in terms of income that really are bringing us to a perfect storm where it is time for a quantum leap and not for continuous improvement. And that we can't just be in the CSR business. And what we need to do is change the context and the rules in which corporations operate because they're simply operating by the rules that they've been given. 
And if we don't change the rules, we don't change the behavior. And I remember this from being an organizational uh, development expert working with the companies like Pacific Bell and American Express used to say that, well, look, you can go in and change your performance approval, uh, performance appraisal system, but if you don't attach rewards to that, to the things that you want, you don't change the behavior of your managers. So at the end of it, we concluded that there were really two fundamental themes that need to be addressed. One is the fact that the system is out of balance that we, don't, we no longer have the strong countervailing balance to corporate power that we once had. And the second is that we have to change the nature of the market system. We have to think on that scale for change to really happen. The first is we really need to redefine the corporate purpose to end short-termism and promote social enterprise. In this area, we really need to change executive compensation. Stock options are driving a short-term emphasis that is externalizing costs to community, to government, and to the environment at a huge rate and to future generations. And we really need to be able to get, begin to quantify externalization and build that into investment practices of pension funds, etc. We also need to determine standards that company, the moral standards that companies need to meet, and we need to have circuit breakers that said, if you don't meet those standards, you can't do business in our communities, you're taxed at a different rate, you're not available for government procurement, you can't receive government subsidies, we need to shift it based on a moral bottom line. The second thing we need to do is redirect capital. Paul Hawken makes a very valid point. And that is that there's no way to really distinguish good companies from bad companies and redirect capital in the direction of those that are good, those that represent the vision that we want for the future. We need to develop rating systems based on normative social and environmental behaviors of corporate behavior. And finally, we need to expand the commons. The commons is an important concept that needs to be developed. These are the resources that are vital for all of us they are for all of our well-being. They should not be exploited for the benefit of a few. Air, water, forests, rivers, vital resources, not just in resources but also in culture, need to be redefined in terms of the commons, and they need, we need to define no-go zones for for-profit corporations, and they need to continually expand. These are areas where for-profit co profit corporations that exist for the, to create benefit for the few cannot go because fundamentally it contradicts the essence of what those resources are about. Those are for the many for the vital and future benefit of the many. And they must be managed by entities that are cognizant, cognizant of that and who are driven by that very principle. Uh, I think the reason that bring the, for this event is the sort of sense that, that uh, corporations as wealth generating institutions are in fact pushing us in the direction of societies both at a national and a global level that we may not want to live in. Uh, and that we want, so therefore we want to do something different. So let me move from there to the question of corporate governance. Now you all understand that it's not a substitute for the role of government. Debates about corporate governance, and I think you have some papers for this event today, tend to sort of polarize around the question of whether the solution to all our problems, whatever those problems are, uh, is giving more power to shareholders or whether it's taking power away from shareholders and giving it either directly or indirectly to, quote, stakeholders, to employees, communities, uh, customers, bondholders. You know, the, stake, the, land, the world of stakeholders is very broad, in fact. I'm increasingly convinced that this is sort of a stupid discussion, frankly, that, it, it, that, that neither, neither formulation is correct uh, and that what's really important here is thinking back to the sort of real purposes of companies in generating wealth over the long term and what balance is in, 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 in corporate governance is the right one in relation to those, to those issues. And, and I'm increasingly convinced that we need to be looking for a common ground between corporate managers, you know, the reviled CEOs, um, uh, whom, whom we all uh, love to trash in various contexts, uh, between managers, uh, employees and long-term investors. Uh, that balance seems to me is where we might have the chance to move corporations, particularly public corporations, in, more systema in, a, w in a more systematic way uh, towards socially positive outcomes. And at the same time, 
meet the very, very real uh, needs and purposes of the people involved in running corporations, making money uh, and make having a return, a sustainable long-term return. The labor movement, in case anyone hasn't noticed, is a lot weaker than it was, say, 40 years ago. Um, our membership, while in, in, in constant numbers, is roughly the same. The, the economy is three times as big. The population is 50% larger. The labor movement is, 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 is slowly shrinking. But nonetheless, the labor movement represents the most powerful force in this society and globally. People talk about counterbalancing forces. We are it. Right? You're talking about real, real sort of hard power. Uh, that is not in the, in, the, in the corporate dynamic, we are it. If you talk about money to counterbalance corporate money in the political process, we are it. Uh, and, um, the, and we are it in places that sort of the, quote, progressive movement never, ever touches uh, in, 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 working, in workers' communities around this country. We are the, you know, the notion of people guard you while you sleep. If you want to know why we still have a constitutional democracy, in large part you owe it to the labor movement that has held some political power during the dark night of the last eight years. And so um, as we think about the future of the corporation, the purpose um, uh, ought to be stated. And I would offer up, and, and we can debate it, I suppose, but I would offer up the creation of a just and sustainable global economy. I think that's what we're talking about here. So maybe that's a 21st century um, objective that uh, mirrors what uh, was developed here in Boston in the late 18th century. Um, also, I think one of the other observation that I hope we keep in mind is this painting to me, in some ways, I'm not sure we've learned very much because um, indeed you had men uh, and one, one boy, uh, men <laughs> um, in doing the work in this assembly um, and women observing. And in some ways, as a couple of people said yesterday, uh, the debate here, uh, I, I think at times was very much focused on, uh, on the United States and uh, potentially maybe with a little bit of British flavor added in. And in fact, um, I was thinking overnight that if the SEC uh, tomorrow were to completely remake the rules that govern corporations uh, chartered in the United States, um, it, it would be partial and, and in some ways um, counterproductive because uh, the world has changed very, very rapidly. As the World Economic Forum uh, put it in their meeting in Davos this past January, uh, it's all about the shifting power equation. And uh, we have very, very powerful actors in other parts of the world with very, very different objectives, uh, different cultures, different corporate governance structures, different legal traditions, a whole range of ways um, that I think we, we cannot succeed in shaping the future uh, of the corporation if we don't think about that broader context. So what we need to have is a restoration of the law of trust, which obligates these people to act. And as we discussed yesterday, there's been vast erosion. The law of economics has taken over. The law of trust now basically is, if it's cost-effective, do it. If it isn't, pay the damages. Now that's not acceptable. We've got to have a change in the law of trust. Now when you get to having engaged owners across the spectrum of political and social opinion. What is it that they're going to ask companies to do? And this is relatively straightforward. They have to take the leadership in demanding a change in the accounting practices. Now it's very simple. There isn't a person alive who thinks that current accounting provides a useful facility for virtually any purpose other than historic records. What did we hear yesterday? 30% of the value of companies can be derived from the figures in their published financial statements. We know that the financial statements are not useful. Indeed, in many respects, we know that the financial statements are genuinely harmful. How is that? Well, they're harmful in the sense that they don't stress what, which is what is good, which is, say, intellectual power, 
and they eliminate what's bad, which on the environmental side is the external costs of the functioning of the corporation. That isn't the way to get an answer. You only get an answer by having the owners actively involved. And so I say, with great optimism, there is a clear way in which we can begin the process of making corporate functioning harmonious with human welfare. And it is not a new notion. It does not require more expense. It does not require a new agency. It simply requires that those people who are majority owners of all the companies in the world, who are obligated under existing trust law to exercise their responsibility for the benefit of all the people, which is the hundreds of millions of people who are owners of mutual funds, who are beneficiaries of employee stock plans. This begins to legitimate the corporate power. So here is a notion that has about it the great virtue of making sense. Now how do we get from here to there? I offer here some preliminary thoughts on what a definition of long-term investment might be. Thank you. Uh, I believe that a full definition of long-term investing needs to take into account three factors. The benefits of holding stocks for a long period of time, the incorporation of environmental, social, and corporate governance factors into stock valuations, and the willingness of investors to add value to their investments. I combine these three factors into the following definition. Long-term investors speculate on the value of corporations to society and the environment while simultaneously seeking to enhance that value at the company, industry, and societal levels. This differs from today's mainstream definition of the role of investors, which values their success only in the maximizing of relative stock returns. When the market is valued according to short-term measurement, that is stock prices, and when managers' performance is measured against these prices, long-term investing becomes impossible. In today's financial markets, investors are relegated to the role of price takers, not value makers. We could choose differently, uh, and that's not the only reason why there's some implication for corporate law because some of that capital gain those the, that income from capital comes from labor I'm not the first person to note that the interest of capital and the interest of labor might conflict so with I I have to disagree with Bob when I when he says that that pursuing giving shareholders more authority and asking them to take more control of the firm is consistent with human flourishing and human welfare because it could be absolutely inconsistent not only in the short term but in the long term as well. I think we could act differently. Uh, we could choose differently in terms of law and we could have different laws. Let me mention a few. One is I think that we could do away with shareholder primacy and ask managers to take into account the, as a matter of law the, the interest of and concerns of all the stakeholders of the firm, not just shareholders. I think that could be put into effect in a number of different ways. You could, you, you could impose upon them a fiduciary duty, enforceable in courts. You could also say to corporations that they have to have stakeholder boards. That's the, the norm in other countries. It, it, is, um, uh, it, it is possible here, and I believe that we would see a real difference in how corporations are run. There are other changes in the law that we could see as well. Obviously, some of this has to be driven by the fact that we need to change the governing jurisdiction. Right now in the United States, the governing jurisdiction for corporate law is Delaware. It's crazy that we let a state that has one-third of one percent of the American population dictate the internal affairs rules of 60 percent of the Fortune 500 and even more of the entire all the publicly traded companies. We don't let companies choose which state governs their environmental laws, their worker protection laws, their tax laws, their family protection policies. Why in the world would we let Delaware provide the corporate law of these jurisdictions when they have no other significant uh, connections to Delaware? For example, uh, Walmart, um, just to take one example, Walmart has 50% more employees than Delaware has citizens. 
does Delaware have any incentive to change its law to be more more protective of the employees of Walmart, to be more protective of the environment that is being soiled by, by, uh, by Walmart facilities, to take into account social welfare, welfare? None at all. We have to transform supply chains into value chains. And we have to bundle values within those chains. We need to align the values between producers, between buyers and traders, between brands and retailers and consumers. What is good for one has to be good for another and also has to be good for the planet. Without that, if it's simply a competitive thing, it's a race to the bottom. When you buy coffee, buyers are looking for quality, they're looking for on-time delivery, they're looking for health and safety issues to be addressed, etc. But they're also People engaged in selling coffee are making money. They're generating employment. They're paying taxes. They're delivering caffeine, which all of us appreciate. They're even um, delivering status in some cases. But they're also delivering, if it's done right, carbon, carbon sequestration in the coffee plantations and in shade-grown coffee in particular. They're delivering climate mitigation. They're delivering watersheds that are effectively act to collect and slowly release water over time. They're delivering birds and biodiversity. They're delivering pollination of the bees and the other insects that live there. These are the multiple values that each product can begin to deliver, but we're not looking at it that way yet. The future corporation is going to buy and sell multiple of these values. There is no question about it if they're going to survive, if we're going to survive, or if the planet is going to survive. And today we want to say, uh, in this panel we want to say, let's look at one particular avenue of change. What, what would alternative corporate designs look like that were designed from the inside out to incorporate social, financial, and environmental concerns? Now, it, my, my research in this field and, and others who have been doing this, this work, uh, we have pretty much concluded that the, the, the future corporation that is going to replace uh, the dominant form of today may not have been invented yet. One of the things that uh, we have learned over the years, Ari Dehus is one of the people who taught us this, Peter Senge, is that uh, companies are living systems. And as living systems, they are self-organizing. And they are self-organized around an idea of who they are and what their mission is. Now you can't take a new mission and simply inject it into a mature living system. It, it simply won't permit it. In, in the same way that you and I wouldn't permit someone to inject a new mission in. <clears throat> and so if the key, if the key issue is, that what, is how companies are organized at their core, how is it that a new mission can be taken up? Uh, well, I, I think we can start by saying, let's look at some of the companies that do have new missions, uh, when they begin, and they do this voluntarily. What does that look like? What are the elements that hold that mission in place? Um, and then we can begin the process of, of replicating and, uh, and learning from these, from these uh, new models. In addition to the the new forms, um, I, I really have hope for an expanded, with the existing corporation for the major multinational, an expanded emphasis in those corporations on things other than stakeholder value. Um, I agree with, with, with Bob and others who came before. I think the shareholder is key, 
but I also think we are wedded to this myth in this country that the shareholder is primary and the shareholder is legally required, shareholder value is legally required to be uh, the primary purpose of all fiduciary duties of a board and officers, and that is not true. Um, other than in liquidation scenarios, boards and management of this company have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders of care to make sure that they are well informed and of loyalty. There are a few other duties as well, but the primary ones, the loyalty of not breaching um, conflicts of interest. However, the fiduciary duties are coupled in this country with something that's called the business judgment rule. And just to pull all the thoughts that people have had together, it is the business judgment rule that allows boards of directors to give management the huge compensation packages that they have. Well, if they have broad enough discretion, if you are paying $150 million to the former chairman of Citibank to go off quietly into the sunset, and you have that discretion, and there is a zero-sum game, you are not paying that money to you know, improve your operations, to pay your employees or whatever. If you have that kind of discretion under the business judgment rule, you could also take that $150 million and promote environmental, sustainability, lower carbon, doing research, coming up with metrics. That is possible under our existing system. A uh, couple things about um, ESOPs and kind of where they are and where they're going. There's about 11,000 of them in the country. That's about twice what there was 20 years ago, uh, covering about 10 million employees. That's about 10% of the U.S. private sector workforce. About 3,500 of them are majority owned. So the other ones, yes, you're sharing with um, the employees, but it's different when you're a minority. You ultimately, you don't have a lot of say there. About 2,000 of them are 100% owned, and that's growing rapidly, and uh, that was uh, due to S corporations being allowed to set up ESOPs, which allowed these transactions to happen at a much faster pace. Uh, there's about $600 billion of assets owned by U.S. ESOPs, and uh, I don't have the comparable number for the whole U.S., but for the association that I'm the past chair of, the average account balance is $65,000. And that's not, an, instead of 401Ks, there's studies um, done that show that 401K is actually better than what comparable companies offer, and ESOP is in addition to that. Um, there are two links that either are or I hope will be up on the 2020 website to two papers that really summarize the statistics as well as all the research that's been done to date on employee ownership. Um, it's not just putting an ESOP in place, it's the ESOP plus the participatory management, the open book, the, the, yeah, the two minutes. Okay. Um, I guess uh, for the future, I see... Uh, and I'm happy to see, maybe I'm looking too hard, um, but I'm happy to see some momentum around employee ownership. Exhibit A in the Wall Street Journal in October, a special insert on small business, 15 companies were honored. Five of the 15 companies were ESOP, employee owned. That's well beyond the penetration of the 11,000 that I mentioned before. Um, best companies to work for in Vermont, we were up there, King Arthur got named number one twice. And there were other Vermont companies that were employee-owned, again, more than our general penetration in the Vermont economy. So there's a lot of good stuff going on, and I think um, my feeling is, is ESOP is one model. I think there are other models. I'd like to see a lot of different kind of creative fostering of models and prototyping of corporate forms, and let's just you know learn from each other as we go forward in time, and just just make up make many many models, and and some of them will really be part of the answer going forward. I think there are corporate leaders, CEOs. I've met 20 personally, and this isn't through um, interviews or surveys. These are having a beer together about their fears and frustrations and opportunities. There are a few that get it. Um, I think they get it in South Africa. I think there's a few in India. I think there's a few in uh, North America. But there are a few. And they are under unbelievable pressure from the system. And we need to help them be successful. Um, there are easily 10 to 50,000 young people below my age. I'm 44. 
but between the ages of 25 and 35 that are really frustrated with the system. And they are caught in this dilemma where they go to business school, they have huge debt, right, after you go to business school and you have to get a good job. And you have seen it at Harvard and Stanford and London Business School and INSEAD. People want a career that has a lot of meaning and they don't know where to go for it. It's just unbelievable. So there is a latent movement that can be activated, I think, very quickly. So a person named John Manzoni, who uh, was number two at BP um, three years ago, said, I am interested in the bottom of the pyramid. I am worried about our corporate form, and I want to figure out how to get into India. And let me fast forward to today. So I call these phantom companies. You have uh, phantom shares of stock. These are phantom companies that are starting to blossom inside these, some of these large organizations. And I'll just give you one example. So this is the phantom company that was started. Um, BP is selling the, the, their mission. I'm going to go through the, new, the, the principles of corporate design just because why we're here. And I'll tell you how this business fits with that because it's a real practical example. So uh, principle number one, the purpose of the corporation is to harness private interests to serve the public interest. There are 760 million people worldwide, households, that have regressive fuel. Regressive fuel is dirty energy, cow dung and wood that is burned in your home and it kills one and a half million people a year. And BP has basically said, we are going to service the needs of 760 million households. Um, our success is cleaning up the air in the kitchen. So imagine a mobility company that services anything that moves going into cooking energy is a huge shift for them. That's their mission in this phantom company that has capital investment of about $100 million already. Number two, corporations shall occur fair returns for shareholders but not at the expense of legitimate interests of other stakeholders. The metric on this is a 15-year horizon. It does not follow any of the internal metrics of the existing financial models in the system. Um, and so they are looking at this as 30 million households as success and a reduction of indoor air pollution in all those households. Um, corporations shall operate sustainably, meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. They are selling pelletized agricultural waste um, in hundreds of thousands of tons that I get from used sugar, used coffee, that is selling at a profit level of about 20% at the net area to people that now have clean energy in their homes. A million people they've sold to in India, and it's expanding to South Africa, Vietnam, and China. Um, corporations shall distribute their wealth equitably um, for those who contribute to wealth creation. Their JV partners are NGOs in legal new forms where they own equity in the local structures and the NGO women in these self-help groups are distributing products and services on behalf of the new organization and making a fair living wage out of that above anything that's happening in the villages. Corporations shall be governed in a manner that is participatory, transparent, ethical, and accountable. Every single management st structure that would be um, used in the BP system has been crushed for this. So I am the external member of the board. It is a phantom organization. It is not papered yet, but it's ready to, ready to get papered. So we have the governance and the air cover of the, um, of the corporation. And corporations shall not infringe on the right of natural persons to, give, to govern themselves nor infringe on other human, human rights. It's just built into what they do. And um, they haven't thought about it much. They're just doing it. And I could give you another example at Nestle and another example at Reuters. Well, I was very impressed with the general range of comments which said that actually people want to change, but uh, there are forces in the system that somehow prevent them from changing. I actually, I actually sometimes think that's an excuse, 
and that uh, people can be bolder than they they dare to be. Um, but I also do think that we need to, in some sense, reform the system. It seems that to me that people who have very short-term views in life have much more power than they should do. That the people who actually invest the money in the organization seem to have more clout than the people who create the wealth in the, in the organization. And I think that could be reversed. And that would allow people to be braver than they, than they have been in the past and as brave as they want to be. And that's what we need, is we need bold leaders taking a stand on these sorts of things.